Great, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to extend a warm welcome to everyone from the Smith College community and also to family and friends who are um, joining us from much farther afield. My name is Ellie Mons. I'm the director of the Health Professions Advising Program at Smith. And today I'm joined as with my event co-host, uh, Anna Silverstein, who is our Assistant Director of Graduate and Professional School Advising. So today we are here to enjoy the second in a series of four events. One note, make... Ellie, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. The live transcript is not, I'm not able to en enable it. All right, let me, there we go, let me try. Okay, how's that? Yes, that's on, thank you. We love technology, it's great. Okay. Um, so anyway, today we are here to enjoy the second in a series of four events that make up the 2022 Smith in the World presentation series. This is a wonderful time where we gather to share in and celebrate the personal, intellectual, and professional growth that Smith students realize from a variety of experiential learning opportunities. For example, students engage in community community service, conduct scientific research, or study abroad, among many other things. Recordings of these presentations are available on the Lazarus Center for Career Development's YouTube channel. This year, happily, our students were in most cases able to return to on-site in-person internships. These circumstances, while at time challenging, have also presented many opportunities for our students to demonstrate their determination, their resilience, and their creativity. They're smithies. After all, we would expect nothing less of them. So with that thought in mind, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our panelists. Their work represents different areas in the broader fields of the natural sciences, healthcare, and engineering. We will kick off today's presentations with Maggie Boyle from the class of 2022. That will be followed by Javeria Shaw from the class of 2023J. Then we will hear from Helen Danielson, class of 2022. And finally, from Lucille Loco, who is also from the class of 2022. Before we begin, I'd like to remind the audience to please keep your microphones muted during the presentations, but you can keep your video on. We will have all of our panelists speak first and then take questions from the audience at the end of their presentations. You are welcome to type your questions into the chat box at any point during the presentations, and Anna and I will monitor those for the question and answer session. So without further delay, I will turn the Zoom podium over to Maggie. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Ellie. Um, today I'm going to be presenting on my summer 2021 internship that focused on mapping microglia in neurodegenerative diseases. So a little bit about me. I'm a senior neuroscience major with a chemistry minor and I'm also pre-med. Um, I'm from central Massachusetts and my research interests really lie in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, and how we can treat those diseases. Additionally, through my time at my summer internship and also through my classes at Smith, I've become particularly interested in a specific cell type called microglia, which are the immune cells of the brain. Um, and microglia have a really interesting relationship with neurodegenerative diseases, which I was very excited about to find an internship that touched on both these topics. So my internship took place at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in the Schaefer Research Lab. It actually began with me reaching out to a Smith alumni, Dr. Rachel Gerstein, who I knew through the Smith Club of Worcester, um, and she was more than happy to help me in finding my internship. Dr. Gerstein connected me to Dr. Dory Schaefer, who I ended up doing my summer internship with. Dr. Schaefer is a leading microglia scientist, uh, and her lab focuses on a variety of topics associated with microglia, from where they are in the brain to their function and the role they play in neurodegenerative diseases. In my time at the Schaefer lab, I will 
currently in the direction of a postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Violetta Duran Laferet, on a variety of different projects. Additionally, something I really wanted to emphasize is that I did use my praxis for this uh, internship, and it was a great resource for me to make this internship accessible and allow me to have an ex a great research experience at a large research institution like UMass Med. So to kind of go more into the science of the research I did, we, again, like I said before, microglia are the immune cells of the brain. So when functioning, functioning normally, they actually can protect our brain from outside toxins or invaders that just can cause harm to our brain and spinal cord. But when they're not functioning property, properly or they're overactive, they can cause more problems than good. More specifically, in um, neurodegenerative diseases, they can cause neuroinflammation, um, which is a hallmark of these diseases. So by studying microglia, we can actually get a better understanding of the pathology of these diseases as a whole, and also how can we treat these diseases and what can be a target for these diseases. So the specific major project I worked on was called the Murfish Project. This was done in collaboration with the Sanderson Center for Optical Experimentation or the Scope Institute at UMass Med, um, which is under the direction of Dr. Christina Bayer, who was also a great mentor for me throughout the summer. Um, within this project, uh, I worked again with Dr. Duran Laferet and another research assistant in the lab, uh, Shannon Becker. And so to kind of go more into what exactly Murfish is, Murfish is an acronym for a really long complicated name, which is multiplexed error robust fluorescent in situ hybridization, um, which essentially is just a really cool form of microscopy. So with MERFISH, we can actually look at a brain, um, look at a brain sample and map a specific cell type in the brain sample. What makes MERFISH so special is that it can do this for multiple cell types at once. So you can look at microglia in comparison to neurons or other glia cells. Uh, this is really important because the localization of microglia is really fundamental to how we can understand neurodegenerative diseases. So seeing where they are in relation to these cell types and also even in brain structure can get us, give us a better understanding of the role they play in neurodegenerative diseases. Um, this whole project was, took us about five days to produce the images necessary um, from the Murfish microscope. So it goes to show how much work really went into this project. Um, and through those five days, we prepared brain samples and analyzed images and data to get a better understanding of the usefulness of this technique and also just the data this technique can give us about microglia in the brain. In my downtime of the Murfish project, I was able to uh, also work on other projects in the lab. So uh, again, with Dr. Duran Laferet, I worked on her uh, project that looked at microglia senescence, which is microglia aging and how this aging can affect neurodegenerative diseases. So it was a very interesting area of, of research I hadn't previously learned a lot about in my um, other research experiences. So that was really cool as well. But I think something, I did learn a lot of lab techniques in my time at the Schaefer Lab, from um, learning how to prepare brain samples to how to culture microglia cells. But really, I think um, this internship had an impact for me beyond the lab as a person and as a student. Um, so I think a major lesson this lab experience taught me was how it, exactly um, it is to be a scientist as a full-time job. I learned a lot about the trials and tribulations of science. and still continue to find love in research and hope to continue to have that as part of my career goals as well. Um, I also think it really empowered me in my thinking and abilities as a student and scientist because being, um, because being around people who are just as passionate about this really small cell in the brain only um, pushes you to further pursue your interests. Additionally, um, I, will be, uh, I am hoping to continue working at the Schaefer Lab post-graduation at Smith. Um, which I'm very excited about because I really enjoyed my experience there. And I think this is where I really want to emphasize the importance of the Smith connection. Dr. Gerstein was incredibly helpful in finding this internship. And without her, I'm not sure um, what I would have done this summer or uh, where I would be going after Smith. So I, that, I really cannot emphasize how great our alum network is and how important it is to make those connections with Smith alumni. I also think uh, through this experience, I really learned how important it is to find your research interests and pursue them because you never know where it'll take you. That can really hone your internship search and also the searches for your career after Smith. Uh, additionally, in my um, time at the Schaefer Lab, I really, again, found love for research and I've always hoped to attend medical school, but uh, now I hope to pursue a dual MD PhD degree that will allow me to pursue both science and medicine at the same time. 
but overall it was just a really great experience and I'm looking forward to my future re uh, research time at the Schaefer lab. But again, a huge takeaway for me was using the resources that Smith provides us from the Lazarus Center to using Praxis to again, the alumni network. Um, it, we're so lucky to have access to those resources and all we can do is take advantage of them in our time at Smith. So thank you everyone for listening. I wanted to give a few thank yous to Dr. Schaefer, Dr. Bayer, Dr. Duran Laforette, and the entirety of the Schaefer Lab at UMass Medical School, Dr. Gerstein for helping me find this internship, and Ellie Mons for all her help in my presentation prep. And from there, I'm gonna pass it on to Javeria. I was muted. Can you all see that? All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Javeria, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about my experience as a population health intern for the Institute for Hope at Metro Health Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. Before we get into that, let's talk about me. So I'm a class of 23J, as mentioned before. I'm a Spanish major, but I'm also pursuing the culture, health, and science of college certificate, and I'm also pre-med just like Maggie. My hometown is Hamden, and in past summers, um, I actually conducted uh, research here at Smith um, doing zebrafish embryonic development under Dr. Michael Baresti. And so one of my favorite things to see was actually the little video I added where you can see kind of the fluorescence showing through the zebrafish is always super cool. Um, and then the next summer, which would have been a sophomore year, is when the pandemic kind of happened. So everything kind of fell apart, but I worked at Amazon and Starbucks, and unfortunately, Amazon had a very strict no photos rule, but I added a photo from my Starbucks time with one of my favorite coworkers, who's actually one of my childhood friends. And so now, this past summer, um, I was a population health intern at Metro Health. So I applied for the, oh, what? Ah! I applied for this program through the summer on the Cuyahoga, which is supported by alums from a bunch of different colleges like Cornell, Oberlin, Case Western, and Smith, among a few. Um, and they set up a bunch of networking opportunities. I got to meet alums from Smith. I got to make so many awesome friends who are actually on this call. Um, and they mean the world to me, and I still talk to them to this day. It's just such a beautiful program. And if you're a student thinking about it, I highly, highly recommend participating. So let's get into the internship itself. So the Institute for Hope stands for Improved Health Through Opportunity, Partnership, and Empowerment, which I think is a really great way to put their mission. Um, they really focus on social determinants of health, which is what impacts your health outside of the doctor's office, right? Like why might you have high blood pressure? Why might your my, why might your A1C levels be elevated? So we look at, do you have access to housing? Do you have access to food? Do you have access to the internet? Because if you can't access resources on the internet, how are you gonna help yourself? Um, and so they use research to create innovative ways to support the community and its members. So like I said before, when we think of what impacts our health outside of just the doctor's office, it's kind of everything, right? Things from when you were a kid to now, to maybe a few years ago. Um, so I tried to break up kind of the work that I worked on within five groups. So starting off digital connectivity, right now we're having this meeting on Zoom and it's really such a privilege to be able to have internet access and phones and computers, but people even within the United States don't have that. So we worked really hard to get people connected to affordable internet, get them devices that they needed, help them figure out how do I access my chart and my, and my test results and my doctor's notes online. And so a lot of that time that I was doing that, I was actually speaking Spanish as well, which is super fun. Um, and so the next thing we were on was lead screening. So through the lead coalition, it was really difficult to see after the pandemic what children were actually getting the preventative care that they needed. So we worked really hard, myself and the other intern, to go through the pediatric wellness registry, which are all these children who are turning two, seeing which ones had gone tested, which ones hadn't, which ones had gone tested and had very elevated lead blood levels, which is very terrifying and scary because it can it can actually um, impact a child's. Uh, mental development even into adulthood. So we really wanted to make sure we were advocating for those children, um, which is super exciting. We ended up bringing a little report and surprisingly, actually a lot of children were getting preventive care, just not here. So it was really exciting to see. Next was food as medicine. So we were delivering food packages to, so, to those who qualify for programming, AKA those who were food insecure or had elevated A1C levels. Um, I think the most fun part of this is that food as medicine actually had kind of like a room in the hospital that was a mini grocery store. So I was picking out items off the shelves, putting them in boxes, and then delivering them once a week, which is really exciting. 
Um, Arts and Health, I collected some resources in the beginning of the summer about the experiences of children in Cleveland, which will be, work, which will be used for a program in the future. But we also distributed lawn signs featuring local artists, which is really exciting to kind of bring vibrancy to the community from the community, if that makes sense. So a lot of people would see the name that was on the lawn sign and go, oh my gosh, I know that person I saw them the other day. And so it's really exciting to be like, yeah, your neighbor is also super talented and a beautiful artist. And now we get to show it off to the rest of the community. And finally, we collected mental health resources. My fellow intern and I, we created a mental health community mental health resource flyer that was separated by East and West. And so the reason we did that is because Cleveland actually is very divided among the East and West side by the Cuyahoga River. There are a lot of cultural and historical reasons for that, but to put it simply, people don't usually cross the river and when they do, it's not very far. So we really wanna make sure that no matter where you were in Cleveland, that you were getting the resources that you needed. And so now what did my work look like? So I have a few photos that are really exciting. I have in this upper left corner, a photo of myself, my fellow intern T, and um, one of the members of the community. This is part of our digital, digital days, which is our digital connectivity effort. Um, I was translating a lot of materials in Spanish during that time. And you never realize how little of a language you know until you're put in a situation where you know none of the words. So obviously I were, I, you know, been a Spanish intern basically my whole time at Smith and I'm learning a lot of Spanish, but not really medical Spanish. So when I end up working there, I was constantly like searching up, how do you say this word? And so now I have a whole new vocabulary for the work that I want to do hopefully in the future. So like referido, like I didn't know how to say referral. I've never given someone a referral, but now I have, and now I know. Um, and so I have this fun little picture of my of my name tag. I was very proud when I first got it. And I just want to focus on the picture in the center, which is actually a mural um, of a woman from the area that we were working in. And there's my fellow intern walking. Um, and she actually was kidnapped when she was very young and then held captive for 10 years. But now as a survivor of that, she's doing work to um, advocate for families of those that are missing. And I had the privilege of actually meeting her. And I think it really captures the energy that exists in Cleveland, especially the way that everyone is taking their life experience to bring back so much vibrancy and so much community back to that area, which is super exciting um, to see them all work together. I met people who lived their, their entire lives, people who had just moved. I met people who obviously like her, who have gone through so much. And it just, it was so exciting to see everyone striving toward one goal, which is just taking care of each other. And so looking forward while looking back, you know, growing up, especially as a woman of color, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to feel that healthcare can advocate for you or your family members, especially those that might not speak English or those that like don't really know much about healthcare. Um, but working at the Institute for Hope made me realize that it can exist. It is not impossible to take care of communities that might not be used to getting taken care of. So encompassing the lived realities of underserved communities is a version of healthcare that can exist which was really exciting. And I also was super inspired by the amount of work that I, the amount of stuff that I learned, especially in the Spanish category. Um, because again, like growing up, I often was translating things for my parents or translating things for family members and being able to be that person in that moment to have someone kind of relax the second they hear you speak their language is really exciting because it feels like you already have someone who's looking at these something that you're worried about who's looking at it beside you versus like against you, if that makes sense. Um, and I just want to end off by saying that before this experience, I was very insecure. I was kind of at a crossroads of, am I doing the right thing? Is this passion of mine to be a doctor? Is that what I should be doing? Is majoring in Spanish what I should be doing? I should be a STEM major. These are all questions that were constantly in my brain, especially during a time where it felt like I kind of felt useless because everything kind of felt like it was falling apart around me. Um, but after this internship, not only was I able to take all the resources that Smith offered me to prove myself to myself that I was worthy and capable of doing this kind of work, I gained confidence in my Spanish ability. I'm so excited to speak to strangers now, which is really fun. Even in like the languages that I already know, I think kind of gave me a new confidence in that sense. But more than anything, it brought me confidence that where I am on the path that I'm on is definitely the right place where I need to be. So I just want to end up by saying thank you to everyone who's here. I know so many of my friends are here. I know um, Sue is also currently here, Marjorie, um, and obviously to Ellie and my fellow presenters, you all are making this possible. And I'm so proud to be able to share my experience with all of you. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to pass it on to Helen, I believe. Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Helen Danielson and I'll be presenting um, on the work I did in biomechanical engineering analysis techniques this summer. Uh, so as an introduction, um, I am a senior engineering and dance double major here at Smith College. Um, I'm interested in a career in molecular bioengineering. So since my first year at Smith, I've been building research experience to support my engineering coursework. Um, I've worked in labs here at Smith, as well as past internships at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, in the fields of developmental biology, uh, biochemistry, and biomolecular engineering. Uh, my goal for this past summer uh, was to expand my research experience beyond the molecular bench work I've done um, and learn some new skills along the way. So as an overview, um, with the help of my advisor, Sarah Moore, I was able to find an internship in Northeastern University's Department of Bioengineering. Um, I worked in Dr. Sandra Schaffelbein's lab, which broadly studies the mechanics and material properties of bones um, in an internship funded by a National Science Foundation supplement. During my time in Dr. Schaffelbein's lab, I worked in four main project areas, um, analyzing CT scans of femur bones, um, imaging rabbit spinal development, doing some work with dance motion capture, um, and training a computational model. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I will focus mostly on the femur scans and the model training. So to um, talk about the femur scans analysis a little bit, the lab I was working in was collaborating with a lab at the University of Ottawa. Um, and that lab at the University of Ottawa was studying how radiation and exercise in various combinations affects bone marrow. Um, so once they had extracted the bone marrow for their own testing, um, they sent these mouse femur samples to the lab I was working in so that we could analyze the material properties of the bones themselves. Um, so one of the first things I did in the lab was take micro CT scans um, of the bones to get images that look like this one. Um, and then when we, when you um, stack all of these images together, you get a three-dimensional image of the bone. Um, so once I had these scans, I analyzed them using a software called ImageJ um, to create a binary to tell the program exactly what was and was not bone in the image. Um, and then I could run that, those images through another software called BoneJ to analyze parameters such as their cross-sectional area, um, their moment of inertia, and the thickness of the bone, which was great. But unfortunately, not all of our samples looked as nice as this one. Um, some of them looked more like this, which is definitely not the same thing, not something we can analyze as well. Um, this was because the the lab at the University of Ottawa had to break the bones to get the bone marrow out. Um, and so now we were working with incomplete femur fragments and the challenge became to find a uniform section across all 40 of our bone samples so that we had something to compare between the groups. Um, and this was especially difficult because the bones weren't all broken in uniform ways. They were just breaking them however they could. So it was my job to find this section um, which ended up being this yellow box here. Um, that was a, about 100 image slices thick. Um, and that's how we were able to average them and then compare the data across the groups of bones. Then to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about the computational model I worked on, um, one of the PhD students in the lab is interested in RNA expression in mouse bone cells. Um, so his work is staining the RNA and then taking a 3D image of the bone. So similar to the CT scans I took, this image here on the right is representative and then you can scroll through a whole stack of images to get a 3D picture of the bone. So he's interested in how many cells are expressing this RNA. So we want to count all the cells in this image um, and every single one of those teeny white dots is a cell. 
So my goal was to train a model called Stardust to count the nuclei for us. Um, so in training this model, I, my main um, challenge was to tell the model exactly what is and is not a cell in this image. Um, so to do this, I took little representative image sections to show the model. Um, so for example, these are the sections, some of the sections I took. Um, you can see like up in the corner, we've got some cells that are really distinct and easy to tell apart from the backdrop, backdrop of the bone. Whereas um, over on this side, we have some cells that are much harder to see. Um, and over here, we have a sample that has a blood vessel in the middle, which is something we're not interested in. So we have to tell the model not to look at, look at a blood vessel and think it's a cell. So to do this, um, I needed to go through my representative samples, um, which this is one of those representative images, and circle every single cell in the image. Um, and to do that, I would create a map that looks something like this. And then because it's a 3D image made of stacks of images, I would need to scroll through the stack and circle all those cells again to show the computer what's a cell coming in and out of view versus two cells stacked on top of each other. Um, this was pretty tedious work to create a set that looked like this. It would take me about 10, um, it would take me between seven and 10 hours of work. Um, and I created about 10 sets as a whole to give the model. So then once I had these sets, I could give them to the model and the model would start training itself on how to recognize cells. Um, from there, we get into how well the model is actually doing. So um, the purple image on the far left is the original image that I gave the program. Um, and then the green is called the ground truth, which is when I looked at that image, that's what I circled as a cell um, to give as a set to the model. And then the purple is a prediction of what the model thought is a cell in that original image before it looked at what I thought was a cell. Um, so then we could overlay my ground truth and the computer's prediction to see where the computer is catching the cells and where it's not. Um, this was really exciting because you can see a lot of those purple and green are overlapping. The, the model's doing a pretty good job of catching all those cells. There are just a couple of green ones in the corner that it didn't catch um, and a couple purple spots where it saw cells that I didn't see. Um, so to conclude a little bit throughout this internship, I developed um, really awesome computational analysis skills. I was also able to improve my time management and project management skills. Um, and I definitely achieved my goal of experiencing a very different type of scientific research than the ones I had done in the past. Looking forward, um, these skills have translated really well to my current thesis project, especially um, time management and project management have been really helpful to me in working through my thesis. Um, this internship also solidified for me that a PhD is something that I want to do after Smith. Um, so I've, um, because of this internship, um, partially I have applied to PhD programs in molecular bioengineering um, and the program at Northeastern University is one of those programs. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I'll pass it on to Lucille. Sorry, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? No? Oh, God. Um, there you go. Good. Okay. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lucille. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a senior bio major on the pre-med track. And um, some of the things I'm passionate about include clinical research, um, public health, and making healthcare more accessible and inclusive. So the title of my research project was the cultural anthropology of antibiotic use and resistance. 
And this was all done in Ghana, which is where I'm from. So the basics of my internship. So this all started with a pandemics class I took with Professor Dorit last spring. And um, my favorite part of the class was, you know, sort of like highlighting how the pandemic was affecting different communities disproportionately, you know, um, how um, access to resources and the different um, availability. So like healthcare professionals was, you know, causing the pandemic to be more severe in different communities. Um, and also being a medical assistant um, during COVID back home and being an EMT in the States sort of gave me that perspective of um, comparing the two healthcare challenges in both places. Um, so I'm very much um, excited about always doing comparative studies between the US and Ghana in the healthcare setting. Um, this opportunity was funded through Praxis, which is a grant through the Lazar Center, um, which made this opportunity possible. And it was all independent research. So I didn't work with a specific company um, or organization. There was a lot of flexibility with my project. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it was close to home, um, which was really fun as well. Um, so the main aim was to understand the patterns that were causing antibiotic use and resistance in Ghana by examining those hidden drivers within and outside hospital settings. And the reason why hidden is in quotation marks will be come clear in the next couple of slides. So um, just to give a brief overview of what antibiotic resistance is, for those who don't know, it's basically when germs like bacteria and fungi, you know, develop this ability to basically fight the drugs that are designed to kill them. And so the antibiotics are no longer effective and the bacteria continue to grow, contributing to the problem. And just putting this in context a little bit, the CDC and WHO describe this as one of the biggest threats to public health. Um, so it's a very serious problem, um, which is why I care about it so much. And just highlighting some of the causes, um, I think this is a very interesting slide. And I put these two side by side just to highlight the fact that um, Generally, the factors that we see, the factors that are advertised against are, you know, overprescribing, patients not finishing their treatment, poor infection control. But in a lot of the conversations I had with Professor Dorit and my time in Ghana, um, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, highlighting the fact that in all these different communities, there's so many social, economic, environmental factors that are, you know, perpetuating this problem. And the fact that they're not emphasized as much is, is a big part of the issue as well. And so that's the main you know, aspect of my project is how can we reveal the cultural factors in different communities that are also contributing to this problem? So basically antibiotic resistance is not just a biological problem. There's a very big socioeconomic aspect of it, which is what my project um, tries to highlight. So um, the main takeaway is that in order for us to tackle antibiotic resistance on a global level, it's very important that we also focus on the socioeconomic factors that are specific to each given community. So basically what I did was I focused on pharmacies in the capital city of Accra and basically divided up the city into four different quadrants. And I had to choose a combination of small and large pharmacies, also public versus private pharmacies. And some of the things I considered in choosing these pharmacies were the patient flow, population density of the areas, and you know the patterns of diseases in each given community. I also had to do a lot of like research to find out what kind of information was already available and in order to identify what gaps of knowledge I wanted to fill. Um, and the hardest part was definitely designing my own survey, you know, finding the questions, making language accessible. Um, so I did a little trial with a few pharmacies, um, sat down with the pharmacist, made sure that all the questions I, were, I was asking, uh, you know, made sense to them um, because there were a lot of different educational backgrounds. So language is a very important factor in, you know, designing the survey. So I included this map just to show you kind of, so these are all the pharmacies I had to physically drive to over the, the four weeks. Um, it was a lot of work. Um, so basically this is the capital city um, and putting it in more context, you can see that it's a very small proportion of Ghana as a whole. So my sample size was really, really small even though I felt so overwhelmed with 65 pharmacies. 
Um, so the main part of the of the of all my work was you know the questionnaire and things I was asking included you know how many customers are you seeing daily how many of those customers are buying antibiotics you know are you are you ensuring that um, before you sell you have prescriptions you know I also wanted to ask questions on the customer base how many of your customers buying antibiotics are women as opposed to men how many of them are high income low income what is the age distribution um another important thing i realized was um emergency situations were something that were also contributing to prescribing antibiotics i mean selling antibiotics without prescriptions so a lot of the questions were also directed towards the pharmacist you know in emergency situations are you ensuring that you know the customer has has a prescription or is it you know I'm going to, you know, probably be really sick tomorrow. Can you please just, you know, blink an eye and sell me the prescription? Um, and a lot of the responses were really, really honest, which is something I was really surprised about. Um, other things we wanted to know was when you are firm and say, no, hey, I need a prescription. Are your customers getting upset? Are they arguing with you until, you know, they're sold the medication? What is a typical response of customers? Um, so it was very exciting, um, sorry, reading all the reviews and the responses to these questions. Um, but generally the results are still in the works right now, which is what we're working on this semester, um, using a lot of statistical data, using R, coding, making all these, um, regression lines showing relationships between all the factors and things that we asked. Um, but generally what we're trying to achieve here is, is there a relationship between you know, the size of a pharmacy and how many prescriptions we're selling? Is there you know, any correlation between um, low income levels and how many customers are you seeing that are coming back for recurring infection? You know, trying to draw you know, those relationships between questions that are not are not usually asked, because in like mainstream research, everything you see has nothing to do with, you know, who is actually staffing these pharmacies, because one thing I realized um, in Ghana is a lot of the pharmacies are not even staffed by pharmacists. It's all oh, like, you know, my daughter is home from the summer and, you know, she's taking control of the pharmacy. So it's little cultural things like that that are, you know, playing a part in contributing to antibiotic resistance as a whole and so i'm really excited to finally get this all drawn up and you know show the results of my work so generally overall my main takeaways are independent research is really really hard um you will fail over and over and you just have to you know go back to the drawing board start over um, and I think I really grew in having a lot of patience for the scientific process. Um, it's definitely made me a more resilient person. Um, some challenges I faced were definitely designing the questionnaire, making sure the language was very accessible. Um, choosing an interview medium was also another big thing because a lot of the pharmacies didn't even have like a computer-based system. And so we had to, you know, make that decision between either going paper-based or, you know, using Google Forms. Um, I also had a much bigger research project in mind, but um, doing this all by myself was really hard. Resource constraints. I had no idea it took like up to six months to get like ethical approval for stuff like this. Um, so all of that was very challenging. Um, but definitely um, I feel very proud of my work um, that I was able to contribute to something that I really care about. And I think Javera mentioned this, which is something I really resonate with. Uh, my work made me feel like I was advocating for um, um, disadvantaged communities, you know, people that are not always represented in mainstream research. Um, and definitely working with my advisor, Rob, was a highlight of my summer. Very, very funny man. Um, made the whole research experience very, very fun. Um, and this was obviously made possible through Praxis, which is something I'm really, really grateful for because I was able to be close to home um, during COVID, very difficult time, but I didn't have to worry about having an income because you know Smith was providing that. Um, and I was able to, it was very, very flexible. I could work my own hours, you know, zoom in with Rob whenever we needed to chat. Um, the flexibility of it made it um, very practical for me. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, definitely learning a lot about, you know, how, how scientific research works and hopefully getting published once all of this is done is super exciting. Um, so I definitely encourage anyone who's thinking about research to definitely use Praxis at least once as you can. And one thing I wanted to end with is 
the way I got into research was was basically a conversation with my advisor. So it's really it seems intimidating as a first year, um, but I would definitely just get in contact with anyone that you know you're excited about your research with. Just have a conversation. You know, can I work in your lab? Is there anything open? Or just floating ideas like this is something I'm interested in. Um, could we chat about a potential project? That's how easy that's how easy it is. And through praxis, you don't have to worry about you know. Um, being paid for all this work that you do. Um, so definitely overall, a great experience. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Lucille. Thank you all, all of our presenters uh, for a wonderful series of uh, presentations and discussions. As I mentioned, we uh, do have time for a few questions. If you'd like to put those in the chat box or uh, actually un unmute your mic and ask it, please go ahead. Anna, do we have a couple questions in the chat? Not yet. We had so much enthusiasm during the presentations. So feel free to to bring in those questions. Actually, I do see one. Um, uh, one of our audience members is asking Helen, um, can you tell us how your dance major integrates or enhances your STEM studies? Yeah, sure. Um, dance and STEM have always been my two passions. Um, so when I was looking for a place to come to school, um, I chose Smith partially because it has engineering and dance programs. Um, this summer was one of the first times I really got to integrate them um, in the research setting. Um, I got to play with some of the motion, motion capture equipment um, associated with the lab I was working in and the footage I gained from that is informing the um, piece I'm choreographing for my dance thesis right now. Um, but more than, um, more than just trying to incorporate the two, dance and um, STEM give me ways to exercise my brain in different ways, which is something that's really important to me. Super. Thank you, Helen. Um, actually, I, I will ask a question. Um, can you, some of you uh, mentioned this briefly, but can you all talk a bit about some of the classes you've taken that really helped inform your thinking and, and then pursuit of uh, some of these projects? And Helen, you wanna start and then we'll give it over to some of the other participants? Sure. Um, yeah, since my, my focus has often been, um, molecular bioengineering, I've taken classes like organic chemistry, um, to supplement that. Um, but some of my more solid engineering core classes, like, um, mechanics, um, and fluid mechanics have really helped me this summer as I was um, having to do work with like bones where they're interested in things like material properties. Okay. Super, some of our, Lucille or any? Uh... Yeah, I can go next. Um, for me, definitely, um, I think one of my favorite things about a liberal arts school is being able to be STEM and also take all of these other classes. Um, definitely a few of the classes that have helped me is I took a sociology class, Intro to Soch, my sophomore year, and we focus a lot on um, class, race, gender, how all of that intersects um, with healthcare and all these other fields. And definitely the pandemics class I mentioned that I took last spring was so unconventional, but definitely the, my favorite class at Smith because um, it really highlighted for me the things that I care about, which are in terms of like um, how different communities, different different people are often not, you know, shown the same, you know, attention and resources to 
you know, all these, these health problems. So definitely a lot of classes that focus on like inequalities and shedding light on like class, gender, and how all of that intersects with, with STEM have definitely been classes that helped me with my research. Maggie or Javeria? Yeah, I can go. Um, so as a neuro major, I've taken a lot of neuro classes um, in my time at Smith and I actually, um, I've learned like kind of basic ideas about my microglia and the role they have in diseases, but I was really lucky um, this past semester to take a seminar with um, one of our professors here at Smith, uh, Alexis Ziemba, and she um, taught a class on targeted drug delivery. So I was really able to uh, take my information I've learned from my internship and apply it into my Smith class um, and de develop a potential therapeutic for uh, multiple sclerosis, although it's very a very rough draft, but it was an interesting way to apply stuff I've learned and stuff I still hope to learn. So, yeah. Great. How about you, Javeria? Yeah, I think just like Maggie, like it's really impacted the classes I'm taking now. Like I'm taking medical ethics and I'm taking emergency care. But I think a class that is not STEM or my major, but I will say really impacted me. And I feel like I carried on a lot of values from it in my work was drawing one, which I know is very different from what everyone else is saying. But drawing one I, was honestly one of the hardest classes I've ever taken to have someone like criticize the work that you care about is a really specific experience that like you really can't get anywhere else than in an art class because you know you might feel like you did a really good job but the teacher can tell you only took five minutes before class to do it so it really um pushed me to have a work ethic in a totally different field is very different but i feel like now in my past internship you know i wouldn't just stop working when i felt like it was done it was more like i will keep working because this work is like constant it is not just a one and done thing so i think that's like a big thing i learned from drawing yeah Super. Do we have other questions from the audience? Lee, go ahead. I see your hand. Yes. First off, thanks, everyone. That was amazing. I, I really enjoyed learning about all of your um, work in, in your presentations. I have a question for either Javeria or Lucille or both. Um, Javeria, I really liked um, how you brought up um, this unfortunate and, and long history of um, medical negligence for um, underrepresented and, and marginalized communities. I'm curious how um, how we can all be better patient advocates, and I know that's a very specific term, but how we can, whether it's advocating for others in a healthcare setting or for ourselves, and anyone can answer that, everyone can answer that, or if anyone has any ideas, I'd just like to hear your thoughts. All right, thank I you, Lee, go ahead. That was a really good question. I feel like it's so hard to answer because a lot of the problems that like we face or like that what we're noticing that others face are like on that systemic level, but definitely on like the more individual level, just making sure that like if you have someone who can't speak a certain language, they have someone beside them who can actually translate it into an easier way or um, maybe like finding someone who might be able to advise you before you go to like a certain appointment or just even sharing resources. Um, I know I spoke about this um, another the previous day was that there are hospitals that create resources for underrepresented groups, but are they putting in the work to bring those underrepresented groups through the door to get those resources? And that's kind of like the biggest problem is that those resources do exist, but they're not reaching the people that they need to reach. So just making sure that if you do know about a resource or you learn about it, getting it to people or getting them to come and take advantage of those resources that exist. Yeah. For other panelists. Yeah, I think that was an excellent answer to Raria. Um, I think just to add in a little bit, I think it all starts with conversation and just ensuring that every like anytime you're, you know, you find yourself in a space where healthcare comes up, that you're contributing to a conversation about, you know, equity and like making healthcare more accessible, whether that's in like, you know, when you visit your doctor, in a conversation with your child, whatever it is, just having starting that conversation like goes a long way. And also even though it's like on a systemic level, like we can make a difference if we all start small. So I think I found that just having these conversations with people I come across, like whether it's pharmacists, whether it's, you know, when I visit the health center, like, you know, how are you making healthcare more inclusive? How are you making it more accessible? Are people, you know, from West Africa, are people from, you know, other marginalized groups, are they able to access all these things that you provide for Smith students? You know, stuff like that actually goes a long way. So I'll definitely say starting small makes a difference. Great. What about you, Helen or Maggie? Oh, 
Other comments, Helen or Maggie on this question? No, I think they both had great answers and they're definitely, their internships really speak to all the important work they've done. Mm -hmm. Super. Okay, I think we have another question, Emily. Do I see your hand? Thank you. Thanks everyone for your fascinating presentations. Um, my question sort of takes it back to the beginning. Um, what kind of advice do you have for other Smithies who may be looking for internships? What did you learn in that process? Could I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my advice for other Smithies is that there is no opportunity that you do not deserve. Like ignore the GPA requirements, ignore like everything, ignore the voice in your head that's saying you will never be good enough for this internship at a very elite institution or whatever it is. Just apply and believe in yourself because if you're a Smith, you can do anything, truly. You deserve to do well and apply to every single internship that exists, every single school that exists. I believe in all of you. Yes. Um, for me, I think my advice is definitely like also believing in yourself, but also don't be afraid to like start something on your own. Um, you don't like you don't have to apply for things that you're not necessarily interested in just to have an internship. I think for me, I was looking for something over the summer, but I didn't really find anything that I really resonated with. So I just sat down with my advisor and he was like, look, what do you care about? And we sort of like made a list and went from there. So you could also, you know, build something from scratch on your own, something that you really care about. And that can turn out into, you know, something, your thesis, you know, something you do after Smith. Um, so don't be afraid to start something on your own. It's definitely my advice. Yeah, I think, I think it was Lucille who mentioned it um, in the presentation, but um, I think it's important to be afraid not to ask for help from your advisor, um, from people in the community, um, in the Smith community, I think there are yeah, so many resources here um, that are that really want to help you find something you're passionate about for the summer. Um, so I think just asking for help um, is never a bad thing. Yeah, my advice is kind of the same. Um, I think using all your resources, especially again, the alumni network, that was incredibly helpful for me. Um, and I also think just not giving up in your internship. Um, I definitely uh, ran into a few roadblocks when I was searching for an internship. And I found that like just constantly trying to find a new possibility, searching a new avenue for an internship was really helpful in finding mine. Super. All right, well, I think in the interest of time, uh, if there aren't any more questions, we will uh, bring today's Smith in the World session to a close. Uh, again, I want to say a very big thank you to our four wonderful panelists and certainly to our audience for their attention and questions. I encourage you to watch uh, the Smith in the World session recordings that are available on the Lazarus Center for Career Development's YouTube channel. And with that, uh, we bring this session to a close and take care everyone. Thanks very much, bye-bye.